Hey everyone, um, today I have a special guest, uh, Mindy from channel Minimalist. Um, <laughs> so today uh, we're going to be discussing red flags, uh, attachment styles, love languages, and you know, the messy process of dating somebody with a different personality type. Yes, let's do it. So I wanted to ask you, uh, what is, <laughs> as an expert... <laughs> I'm an expert in the field, of course. <laughs> the Dr. Love. Uh, Give me my glasses. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, what is uh, your biggest uh, misunderstanding that you've had in a relationship so far in terms of communication? Or like, it can be the silliest thing, you know, like... Um, damn. Well, if you go through my channel, you have a video where I talk about personality GTE, um compatibility between an ENFP and an ESFP and there I talk about plenty of misunderstandings <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, one of the, the, the biggest one um, that I have had uh, because that was like my longest relationship was that I would explain something very abstract and the other person would say but what are you what are you talking about but but can you can you can you go from A to Z to Z can you, like, I don't understand. And that was just continuously a problem. Yeah, I've actually had that as well when I was uh, dealing, uh, when I've had the relationships with sensing types. And it was in a sense, uh, whenever I would speculate about things or say something like, uh, I think it could open at that time or it could be like, uh, it could work out like this. They would be like, but you don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't guess about things. What is that? Guessing about things? Uh, I need evidence. <laughs> yeah, too unpredictable, no. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I'm always uh, coming from the approach of uh, figure it out. Uh, these kind of misunderstandings are so common, but we tend to stay kind of in that zone in a sense. So we stay in the sense of, okay, we've having, we're having a misunderstanding. We keep having that same conflict over and over again. And it becomes like this whole power dynamic in a sense, because it always comes to who's right and who's wrong, and who's the idiot or who's the bad person, who's the good person. Uh, Painful. Yeah. Been there. <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm wondering, like, how can you break those kind of scripts uh, that you get into? Um, one script I was thinking about was the kind of like the nice guy script that you can get into sometimes, uh, where it's like uh, a lot of uh, guys think that, uh, yeah, if I'm nice to another person and I'm helping them and supporting them and things like that, that everything will be uh, perfect and uh, everything will be great. Uh, and... Um, they're not getting that response that they expect in that. Uh, they're, they're like, but I'm nice. So why don't they like me back? Why are they uh, still angry with me? Or why do they exactly. not want to have a conf? Why are they so confrontational? Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've seen that a lot on guys, you, you know, like I think that that's one of uh, a big problem, I think amongst couples is that many, uh, th let's say men, but maybe some women as well, God knows, they feel like, okay, I like to go the extra mile and do what I can to make the other person happy, but they, it's never enough. They're, they're never satisfied. They are not, you know, happy. They're always bitchy and then they always find for a next thing that uh, it's not working in the relationship. Yeah, it's... Um... I think it's natural to always want things to get better and to always want to improve things and to always want to challenge boundaries. I'm learning that you have to set boundaries every single day. Like I started like speaking out a lot more for myself at my work uh, over the past months, uh, but I'm learning that it's not enough to speak out for yourself once in a, uh, in a relationship or at work or with anyone. You have to constantly do it every single day over and over again, because people are always going to be like, can I get a little bit more from this exchange? Can I get a bit less? Like what's in it for me? Uh, like people don't always look at things for, as a collaborative exchange of how do we uh, get things equal in a sense. Yeah, I mean, if you ask me, uh, how do you break that pattern? I mean, there are two answers. I think one is like when you are already in a relationship, like how do you solve that? Okay, that can be complicated. I mean, yeah, you can try for yourself to be more open and more communicative, but you are like with another person. So you don't know if the other person is going to be open to that. And you can also try therapy um to have like a mediator who helps to communicate but outside of like let's say 
this example, when you're in a relationship, let's say the other case scenario is that you are now single and looking for a relationship. And so I think you want to look for someone who has the, the growth mindsets, someone who is willing to look into themselves and to question themselves when something is not going well. Uh, like, of course, with regards to themselves, but also to the relationship. And I think that's something that you learn by spending time with that person, by talking to that person. But I think for me personally, that is a, a big factor. And I wouldn't want to be with someone who is not willing to have like an open and honest communication. Um, and, and, and I can say this, but at the same time, having an open and, and vulnerable conversation with someone is so difficult, even for me. So it would be nice, for instance, to say to the other person, you know what, I want to talk about this, but you know, I feel that I can't because there is a lot of uh, years that I've done this uh, like the old way. So it's difficult for me to break the pattern. It would be nice to, you know, be able to openly say, talk about your, your struggles and your demons with the other person. Yeah. It's just another level, I think. Yeah, like I can say like yeah, something that I've always struggled with is uh, uh, my, uh, you could say my thinking function and my sensing function. And that's like always been like, I, I know that I have to become a more attentive partner in relationships a lot of the time, like actually think about the other person and their situation and what's happening in the situation. Uh, uh, and also I have to be better at dealing with criticism, uh, because, uh, yeah, for me, uh, I've always experienced criticism as like a kind of, uh, it drains me of energy. It makes me feel flat. It makes me like feel a sense of failure and uh, I can become very dramatic in that space of getting criticism. So my response can be, okay, everything about me sucks. Okay. <laughs> like that's uh, like, that's. Um, that's a spiral that I keep having also in friendships and connections with others as well. Like, yeah, okay, if they uh, criticize me, are we enemies or friends or are they, do they hate me or do they like me? Like, how can you, like, uh, um, you, you have to somehow break that script and stop thinking about those things in the sense of good or bad or uh, just, like, allow for criticism to just be criticism. Yeah. And, and do you, can you discern when the criticism is positive constructive or negative or you you feel it's always constructive destructive <laughs> oh I, I know that the criticism is most uh, can always be constructive you can always learn something from it. it's not always correct uh in a sense so the other person can be way off base in what they're saying and what they're doing um but it can still be interesting to learn why where does it come from and what made that person say that uh because uh yeah, um, it might be other things at play here than what the, it's not always the surface thing of what the other person is criticizing. It might not be like a problem that uh, you forget to close kitchen doors or something like that, but it can be like a general pattern that you're having, like where uh, that a person feels like uh, you're not stepping up in terms of uh, cleaning or organization or things like that. Yeah, so there is an underlying uh, problem under underneath the... Yeah. The problem. The yeah. problem is never the problem. <laughs> no, it's uh, never the problem. Uh, so, uh, I come from Swedish culture and Swedish culture is very peaceful. And like if there is a problem or conflict, Swedish people who listen will notice it's like you don't want to talk about it in a direct sense or in a confrontation confrontational way. Uh, you want to kind of sweep it under the rug or... Uh, you want to handle it implicitly in a sense or uh, you indicate or hint towards something but you never want to be aggressive uh, doesn't sound good for a romantic <laughs> relationship guys don't do that no um, don't do the swedish style <laughs> i feel like you can think uh, anything you like about gender roles or masculinity or femininity or things like that but I am learning that relationships always have to have a kind of dance uh, where you have to have somebody that can be initiating and pushing and somebody that can be adapting to or uh, responding to or dealing with or adjusting to that flow um, and uh, if you are kind of uh, not doing that, the relationship can easily like stagnate in a sense. Like if uh, nobody is stepping up or being the pusher or setting boundaries, then the relationship becomes the comfort zone in a sense, or it becomes a bit dull. Yeah, and which um, role of those two do you like yourself? More like taking actions or more following the other? I like... Uh, being uh, the more the observer in a sense uh, I like uh, 
uh, the other person usually initiating things and things like that. I usually enjoy those roles more. Uh, but I also like to be the protector and uh, kind of the guardian in a sense to make sure that the other person feels safe. Yeah. Uh, and I like to be uh, uh, kind of the person that makes sure the other person doesn't do anything crazy. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> uh, so like, you like crazy people. <laughs> yeah, I, I do like crazy people. Uh, it's a general pattern. Everyone I've dated has been crazy. <laughs> So. Okay, like Clementine from The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Have you seen that film? Yeah, um, I like creative people. As you said, uh, and um, uh, colored hair is certainly a nice thing to have, but it's not necessarily like something I ever looked for. But I, I, it's just I like chaos in other people because I get a lot of inspiration and energy from it, and it's mm -hmm. like a nice space for me to bounce against. Like yeah. if they have that flow of energy and enthusiasm and uh, joy of novelty seeking then I can always be pushed to try new things and uh, that can keep me from uh, going into my own comfort zone, which I so easily can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in the end, sounds like, okay, um, a bit of the passive role because you want that the other person is more like pushing you somehow. Uh, uh, pushing me through ideas, certainly, yeah. Uh, but I don't think that that role for me is passive and I don't feel like I'm usually the passive person. Uh, in relationships because I'm usually uh, very responsible in a sense. I usually am the one that makes sure that uh, the other person is okay emotionally and uh, that uh, things are uh, going well and uh, I usually feel like I uh, uh, yeah, uh, tend to help and support the other person a lot and inspire them as well in my own way. Yeah, F.E. Sounds yeah. like it, right? Yeah, uh, I am very like, uh, there's like a lot of things I can do. Like I, I'm very good at giving compliments to people uh, in those situations. And I can be like very much not just giving a person a compliment, but also saying, uh, I like that you do this. And that when you do this, it makes me feel this way, which is really nice. And I like, I like really building another person up and making them like really empowered in a sense. He does that very well. He makes me feel confident about my content. <laughs> yeah like Thank because you. yeah i i feel like you've also empowered me in a sense and that uh, you've uh, uh also inspired some of the changes that i made on my channel did uh, i a little bit i uh, just know uh, that no, no uh but 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 you did because uh, I, I was inspired by seeing how you uh, started filming differently and how you started employing those things. Uh, and I don't think I could ever do something like that. I, I think it's really amazing in terms of editing and all those things. Uh, but I uh, definitely have started looking at how I can do it in my own way, in a sense. Now, maybe you cannot do what I do because you can do what you do, what yeah. you can do. And maybe yeah. it's just a, like a process of developing your own style of editing and filming and in the end you're like not in the end because we're always growing but eventually you're going to do something completely different than what you do now that doesn't look like mine because it's yours yeah i was wondering uh what uh, kind of partners do you tend to feel attracted to um i think not, since i know from a moment i learned about the personality types right mm. i learned that i'm an intuitive mm. and that i seem to connect more even with friends that are intuitive more than with sensor of course I have sensor friends as well so when I noticed that maybe that was a big thing that was not working with previous relationships then I went on to look more for the intuition than for sensing for instance because before I knew uh, about Myers-Briggs as you already heard I have a video about ENFP and ESFP and I had a relationship with this person for almost four years and yeah, so before maybe I was more feeling more attracted to the, what was completely different to me and in a very subconscious level. I don't know why, but now that I know what what matches better with me, I think I, that that's something that I look into. But that's not only it. And as I say in other videos, well, we just recorded another video for my channel. If you don't follow me, go and check it out right now. I talk about the, the labels of personality types are not always uh, positive. So, uh, yes, it's true that you can use a little bit of the information of, you know, like general information of personality types. But mm. I'm not going to say, yes, I, I would definitely go only for an intuitive. Because what if I meet a sensor who also matches with the other core values that I look into a person? 
and and but this person even though they're a sensor they still use intuition to a level that i feel comfortable with yeah actually like i've been starting looking more into development as a factor and maturity when i look for a partner as well because i know that i'm kind of in a stage now where i'm not just looking for a reassuring or accommodating partner anymore in a sense uh, but i'm looking for also somebody that is uh, uh, open to go outside the norms and uh, confident in themselves enough to uh, stand up for themselves and what they believe in in a sense even if that might get them criticism now uh, I'm starting to find that really really attractive in another person if they are very confident and very uh, secure in their values and what they believe in because I feel a lot of people are very insecure in a sense they're like they, they, they kind of hide behind other people they, they are politically correct they say what they think other people want to hear but I'm noticing how bored I'm getting by that. So like when people are talking about something and you hear them say the same old thing, same old story over and over again. Uh, and it's so easy for me, like I can be the person that can be the caregiver and uh, often the supporter of another person, but it can be so one-sided if I'm constantly aware of everything that a person is going through and always understands everything about them and uh, can always fix everything for them easily. Uh, it becomes a bad power dynamic. And do you think that everybody else needs that little challenge because what you're t talking about is like a bit of a challenge in a relationship isn't it a healthy challenge i'm not talking about a crazy challenge here i think everyone uh, definitely should look for a partner that uh, uh, pushes them in a way that uh, like in the direction of your values i would say uh, find a partner that pushes you in the direction of what you want in life. So if they're pushing you uh, in a role that you don't like or that you don't feel comfortable in, of course, then that's, that can be a very difficult thing. But if they can encourage you to try new things that can help you get further towards what you want, that, I think, can be really important. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I agree with that. Maybe in the past I would have said, no, uh, someone who challenges you or who pushes you, is it's negative, but... Yes, it could be negative if they do it in a like not nice way. But uh, one example for me is like I would look into my friendships, for instance, and my closest friends, they absolutely challenge me to become a better person. Like they do. And that is always the reference for me. Like who are my best friends or who, uh, what is like the relationships that work in my life? How are they? Mm. What do they have in common? How do they behave with me? What is, what is the dynamics? And of course, like a romantic partner is different than a friendship, but there should be an element to like where you feel comfortable. And, and that is what I notice with those friendships. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely not the case that I'm looking for a partner that is challenging in a kind of mean or inconsiderate way. That's, that's, that's I mean, it. Yeah. Like, I'm actually, I'm a sensitive person. I always been, and I will always be sensitive to some degree. I've, I'm learning to manage it in a sense. Like, I know that now that even if I can get sensitive about something, I can still push through that and I can still uh, stay logical and rational and I can be self-aware and understand, oh yeah, you're being sensitive or you're being over, you're overreacting right now. You, I, I, I'm starting to develop that self-consciousness uh, to understand those things. But uh, I definitely know that if I had a partner that was constantly beating down everything I did or questioning and criticizing everything, I wouldn't get any energy from that. No. Now... Uh, yeah, imagine that you've had a relationship with a partner like that for 10 years, then should you just leave? Or is that like, uh, can you do something about that, do you think? I do think it is possible. And actually, that's something I wanted to say, that I think nowadays everything is just like disposal. Yeah. And if, the, if it doesn't work, you just move on because you you're not wired anymore to wanting to be in a relationship for long and for and by any means i'm saying that people should endure uh, partners that are abusive in any sense of the word yeah. abusive not at all yeah. but there are situations when people just give up on each other because of differences and 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 without doing until the last thing that the very last thing that they could do to save the relationship yeah I really do think that people should uh, fight through things if, it, if they are in a difficult spot and things are difficult and you notice you're having the same conflicts over and over again. Like you should definitely hit that point where you actually stand up for each other. It's like, okay, but what can we do about this? I know we've had this conflict so many times and we're running into this. What can we do to get through this? And if you need help to seek out a counselor, like Sue said, but uh, really just 
uh, make sure you do everything you can to amend it. Because also, I think if you do want to leave that situation in them, and if you do realize that was the best choice, you still want to feel like you tried everything and you so that there's no what ifs in a sense. Yeah, I've seen that many couples that have a very good relationship, not all of them had like a very nice and easy relationship from the beginning. Many of them maybe had like a like first two, three years were amazing. Then they went through crisis until the fourth year and you know, on a seven, eight year, then they come through the other side of the tunnel. And because those those years of struggle that was a time when they really got to know each other and they overcame a lot of obstacles together. And in the end, like you see them after 10, 15, 20 years, they're happily together. But it doesn't mean that, yes, everybody will have from the beginning a super happy and easy relationship. Yeah. So I think, I believe, I don't know if you believe in this, that relationships, every relationship, also friendships and family, parents, but particularly the romantic relationships are and an opportunity for us to heal mm. our wounds mm. because we all have wounds from our upbringing and some people believe that we come into this world already with some healing to do in our souls so yeah. i don't know if i believe in that to be honest but let's go back to the parents situation yeah. we, we all have a situation even if your parents were amazing when they went late to pick you up at school and you were alone for three hours and all kids left and you feel abandoned forever scarred for life Exactly. Even if your parents were amazing. Now imagine if your parents were not amazing. Uh, and so the point is like all of those situations give you a certain kind of baggage. Mm. And you at some point in your life when you have relationships, those, the, the pains, the wounds that you carry with you from those, the baggage, they come out to the surface. Yeah. And that's a moment when many relationships end because the other person thinks that they're doing, they're, they're being mean, they're being yeah. like awful to me. And so like, I, there, there can happen a lot of things, but one of them is like, okay, you give up on each other easily or you are, you're not capable of look through the pain of your partner or whatever they're going through. Maybe they're going through a traumatic or re they're reviving an event, you know, you don't know, but many people just say like, oh yeah, I'm dating this person for a year and uh, you know, like they just, oh, they went crazy or they're not doing well. Now they just spoke to me in a tone that I don't like and I'm out without trying yeah. to even look into what's happening here. And that's the kind of red flag culture, you could call it almost, like where people are very hyper aware of, you know, like, uh, oh no, that's a red flag or no, I would not uh, like that or that's not going to work for me in a sense. And then uh, it's, uh, yeah, it can keep people in a loop where they're constantly dating or on and on and on for like decades, like always wondering, like, why is there something wrong with every single person I meet? Why are this, uh, all these people have red flags? Why are all men so like that? Or why are all girls like this? <laughs> and it's... Uh, yeah, I think uh, obviously it's good to have some awareness of, yeah, you should never accept, I think, abuse or, uh, yeah, anything like that. Of course not. But uh, you should definitely always uh, have a conversation and vocalize boundaries, not just pull away or run away when there are boundaries, when you hit against boundaries or bad things. But to actually have a conversation and say, hey, I don't like when you use that tone. Can you talk to me differently? Or like actually just have that conversation first and before, because I think... That, uh, yeah, we're, I think we're almost all a little bit fearful avoidant today. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, it's like the push and pull culture has really like become exploded in a sense. And I think it's because it's so easy to you know, find a date today almost. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I was thinking the same. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, yeah, you can just go on Tinder uh, tomorrow and uh, move on. And uh, you can feel like, oh, I'm uh, moving on and doing something different in a sense. And that's also the, the love bombing culture, right? Like at the beginning, you start dating or whatever, use the dating app, dating a person. Everything is amazing. They focus their attention on each other and like all is well and then one thing happened and then i'm out you know that's <laughs> yeah it's like what i talk about in my videos about door slamming it's like for me like door slamming is an absolute no never uh like uh it's one of my like strongest values like i have been on the side of being door slammed or ghosted by people in the past and i don't think that's something you should do to another person like i think it's always the better to say like sorry i'm not feeling good about this and to actually leave an explanation actually like uh, in a sense uh, that this is not going to work for me but 
yeah, we can still be on a friendly, like you should always say kind of a friendly closure in a sense, if possible. Yeah, be decent. Yeah. Uh, with door slamming, it's such an easy thing to do. And I think I've had thoughts about doing the same a few times in my life, for sure. Like I felt like running away in certain situations or uh, seeking the easy route in a sense. But uh, I think uh, for love, you need courage. Uh, so you definitely have to somehow uh, push through that tendency and say, uh, yeah, I've been having these feelings or worries or anxieties or things like that. And uh, these, uh, this has not been feeling right with me. And uh, yeah, I want to talk about it and see how you feel about it. But this tool also of the, the attachment style is super helpful because you notice if you learn more about this, that you are anxious, you have an anxious attachment, for instance, you're always nervous and fearful that people is going to abandon you and you give too much and you cling too early to a relationship. So naturally, the people who feel like this tend to attract avoidant people. So notice what is your pattern and, and, and okay, why do you feel attracted to them? Possibly it's in a, sub, to a, sub, in a subconscious level that you feel attracted to this dismissive um, kind of attitude, you don't even notice. But when you learn more about your attachment style, then you notice, okay, this person actually, uh, I am all over the place for them and they haven't uh, texted me back in a week. I mean, sorry, that's not a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> no, of course. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, stop giving yourself away and being nervous about someone who doesn't deserve your attention because they are not even showing up. So this is the other stream. So people also, on the other hand, will run away easily from a relationship, but also people too early on will feel like highly invested in people that don't even show them that they are interested enough. And still, like we live in this kind of like social media culture where I think like attention uh, to another person is very difficult. It's very hard to get the attention of another person because they're living their entirely different life, somewhere completely different. And your communication is often just based on text messages. And that's not we're going to convey to you the feelings of the other person, the attention and the energy and s stimulation you get from like a small text message. It's never going to like be enough to keep your attention going for a longer time I think no so you uh, definitely need to schedule like weekly calls with each other preferably video calls if you live on a distance uh, or you need to make sure that you have consistent meetups or that you actually take the time to have quality time together you know yeah absolutely uh, and that leads me to like the final topic I want to talk about and it was uh, love languages oh yeah <laughs> and uh, so I was wondering, what do you know your love languages? I do, I do. Well, I don't think I have only one, but I noticed that I feel the most loved because it's always about the most, you feel when you feel the most loved, by act of service, I think, when people do acts of service hmm. uh, for me. So when they try to, when they go out of the way to make my life easier, when they show me with actions that they care about me so for me if they tell me oh you know i love you that doesn't mean for me much as if of course i like to be told that but if they say that but they they, they do nothing for me then that's just for me this it means nothing to yeah. be honest they can come with a presence and of course i can also like presents but if they their actions don't show me that they do care about me you see i'm really an act of service person then i just <laughs> don't i i can um Totally understand that. I think mine is uh, words of affirmation or quality time. Um, I uh, really, like I uh, said before, like the ability to actually uh, sit and talk with a person or just spend time together. Or, I don't know, listen to music or share a moment together. Like all those moments, I think, are extremely magical. Yeah. Uh, but also, uh, I really like, you know, uh, uh, like the words of affirmation. Or it's, can you also be something simple, like seeing the smile on another person's face when you made them feel happy about something or uh, like uh, anything that just makes you feel like, yeah, uh, we are like bonding or we're connecting or we're having like a moment or something like that. I think that's, yeah. Yeah. But you know also that you can have like two different love languages. So one that you like to receive and one that you like to give the most. Mm, of course is that the same for you both of them or does it change when you are when you give i think i uh, definitely still uh, value being given quality time yeah me too <laughs> i think that that's the biggest one i give yeah. but i like to receive more acts of service that of course both of them but 
Yeah, I noticed that that's yeah, I think I'm more bigger on quality time probably. Yeah, I think actually that, that's the one I want to see the most. I actually heard that uh, somebody flipped it and said that uh, your love languages also resp uh, tend to represent the things that you uh, deny yourself the most often. Uh, so if you have acts of service as your highest love language, it might also be that you're a person that forgets to sometimes uh, take care of yourself or to do nice things for yourself in a sense like you're not uh, you I don't have time I have to finish this or I have to work hard or I have to push myself <laughs> so it's um, I think that it I think if you have that feeling like oh you never have time for yourself and, and to then have somebody that gives you that it's like yeah okay then you that's that means more I guess because you need that more it's not that I don't have time for myself like I do but I well, I got the ADD diagnosed lately. Yeah. I just, I, I'm not good at focusing on, like, on things I want to focus. And no. I, so I'm, I'm just, I'm working on something and then I even forget to go to, to, to pee. I forget to eat. I forget, to, you know, like, I don't notice those things. Uh, so it's not that I don't want. But no. it's, um... It's, yeah, uh, this, it's the creative life. You're so uh, you're passionate. You have so many things you want to do uh, that um, uh, you forget about the present in a sense. Yeah, that is true. But maybe, yeah, that you can explain then your theory. Probably that's, uh, that's probably true then. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So um, I want to say uh, uh, thank you for uh, coming on my channel. Uh, yeah, and I want to say uh, to everyone, just check out the Minimalism. I'll link her channel down below. Uh, subscribe and get her to how many subscribers do you have now? Um, twenty eight hundred. It's time to get to three thousand. It's time to get to three thousand. 